Good evening, and welcome to Los Angeles. My name is Doug Richardson. I'm the executive director of the association. It's great to see so many friends here from all around the world. We have here now more than 7,500 geographers assembled. I'd like to extend a special welcome to all of our international participants who are here, who now comprise more than one third of our attendees at the AG annual meetings. What's wonderful about our meetings and our discipline is the wide range of geographic interests, topics, and perspectives that collide to provide new insights and new ideas at gatherings such as this. We've tried hard over the past decade to be inclusive at the AG and to create a room in the House of Geography for everyone at our annual meetings, but also to sustain a large commons concept and idea, a place where we can all still come together and interact, share common experiences, build community across sub-disciplines, and also build communities with our colleagues from around the world. In recent years, this diversity is reflected in the many new initiatives which we've undertaken at the AG, ranging from geo-humanities to the geosciences, and from new frontiers in health research to legislative efforts to protect and expand geographic education, funding at all levels for K-12, from K-12 through higher education. The AG now maintains a full-time governmental affairs program monitoring and responding to legislative and policy opportunities for and threats to geography. We're building a strong financial foundation for the AG and the discipline's future, while at the same time initiating many valuable new programs <clears throat> and keeping our membership and meeting registration fees far lower than most of our peer associations. We invite your ideas and participation in these many dynamic new programs uh, during this meeting and in the years ahead. As we begin another annual gathering of the tribe, as Billy Lee Turner has characterized it, I hope you will enjoy the next week seeing old friends and making new ones. I think most of us are convinced that what we do as geographers is important, perhaps necessary, to better understanding our world and to making it a better place. So let's join together this week, drawing on our rich traditions combined with our new sciences and technologies, leavened with our critical theory and practice to collectively forge a more central place for geography in the university and in society. Before turning this plenary, opening plenary session over to Eric, um, I would like to take just a moment to thank some of those who worked so hard and so long to help make this a, su a successful meeting. Firstly, I'd like to thank the AG staff. Is, uh, is Oscar Larson here? <clears throat> Back in the corner here. With the rest of the AG staff who are here in the room, please stand up. <clears throat> Probably very few of you have any really clear understanding of how much work actually goes into this kind of process, and it, it, Oscar has just been terrific in that, that role as well as all of our staff. I'd also like to thank the Los Angeles Local Arrangements Committee. Our co-chairs, Jenny Zorn and John Agnew here. Stand up, please. Let's give them a ring. They and the committee have uh, really worked very hard, and I think you'll see in this meeting there are more workshops and more field trips than any other meeting. We have over 25 workshops, over 25 uh, field trips. So we hope you'll enjoy, I hope you'll enjoy the many sessions, um, the special thematic tracks, the workshops, the field trips uh, at this meeting. And uh, I also hope you might enjoy navigating the meeting with our new mobile app, which you probably just downloaded, and I hope that that, that will help. <laughs> like so many of the transitions we've been making lately, uh, which involve digital, uh, new digital products, 
Um, as I said in my column on this, uh, there's a sort of a, a wistful sense of loss that I share with many of you with the uh, passing of some of our hard copy uh, products and publications. But uh, it's a trend that, that is going to uh, continue and we're trying to keep up with it. Uh, I'd like to invite all of you to use that app and give us feedback, not only on the application, but on anything and everything that we do at the AG. We need your feedback, we need your support, and um, it's always a pleasure and a joy working together with you. So come forward with any ideas, thoughts, suggestions that you may have, both during this meeting and during the coming year. It is now my great pleasure to, to introduce our current AG president, Eric Shepard, who will present this evening's presidential plenary. I think most of you know Eric. He's now a professor at UCLA. That's all I'm gonna say at the moment. We'll have plenty of time to elaborate on that res resume uh, in the future uh, sessions of this meeting. Eric, would you please begin the session? Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this 109th year of the association. Please join me first in thanking Doug, who's too modest to thank himself for everything that he has done to make this possible. And, and welcome to my new hometown, yes. I wanted to begin by just giving you a sense of the context in which I set up the session, um, also the context in which I asked the speakers to, to, to talk. The session is labeled Emerging Asias. I, I, I present this in some sense as a provocation to the discipline to get us, at least the American discipline, to get us outside our comfort zone a little bit. And there are really four broad motivations, one of which is to be thinking about our association as much more than an association of American geographers, to be thinking about how geographical knowledge and the potential of geographical knowledge extends well beyond that which is created in the Anglophone forums like this and to be taking that knowledge seriously, to be provoking, if you will, new geographies of knowledge production. Thirdly, from a personal perspective, I've become more and more fascinated with Asia. It's certainly a region I was never trained in, um, but I've worked with brilliant students over the years who've taught me many things and I'm going there more and more often and every time I go, I, my eyes are opened again in a different way. So I think it's a region all of us need to be attending to with, 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 with great fascination. And finally, a geographical region, this is Los Angeles, we're in the Pacific Rim, this is in many senses an Asian city, and, and so it seems to be the right place for this theme. Let me unpack these two words, Asia's and emerging, that, that make up the session. Asia is, of course, a social construction. The word goes back to the Greek geographer Herodotus, at least, to refer to that part of the world which was east of, 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 of the Greek world, with Libya being the part to the south. So it's, it, it's always been oriented with respect to what we now think of as the European realm. I think it had a much more positive intimation at that point in time than the Orientalism which came to capture uh, or represent that, that region more recently. It's an area who's, which is extended in the European imaginary further and further east as we've learned more about the world. And it's one with contested boundaries. There is no, it's not like Australia, you can't draw a nice sea boundary around it and desires to be European, desires to be Asian make the boundary inevitably fuzzy. And finally, it's an incredibly heterogeneous region. You look at the multitude of populations, cultures, biophysical environments that make it up and you can see that the word is just an arbitrary term for a incredibly large chunk of, of, of the globe. And when we say Asia is in the plural, we're not just talking about different regions in the traditional geographical sense. We're talking about Asia's that are multiplying in all kinds of ways that are both geographical and social and cultural and biophysical. These various Asia's stretch around, across and through one another, dialectically entangling the emergent places, networks and scales through which they are constituted. And of course, they've also long been complexly in co-implicated with the variegated and emergent Europe's, Americas, Africa's, and Oceania's that they have co-evolved with. But nevertheless, it still seems to make sense to gather what we think of as Asia and, and pay some attention to it. Emerging also is, 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 a, is a term that has multiple meanings. On the one hand, it has a kind of traditional meaning of a kind of emergence from the darkness into the light. 
And that's often the way in which the term is used these days, at least in, in development circles, representing Asia as this set of emerging economies that somehow are now becoming um, well um, organized parts of globalizing capitalism. Not only are they emerging, but in some sense they're seen as, as converging. I, I think not at all accurately. But I, want, I prefer to use the term emergence differently. I use it in the way in which it gets used in philosophy and in complexity theory to refer to how a phenomenon, as it changes, exhibits novel features that cannot really be predicted from its previous state. And that's certainly the case with these regions of the world. And of course, it's not positive. We have the spectacular Asias of Dubai, uh, John, Tom Friedman's golfers on, on, in, in Bangalore. We, ha we have sovereign wealth funds. We have commodified and prosperous environments. And then we have, if you like, the exploited Asias those inhabited and made by the people whose, whose labor and dispossession makes them spectacular Asia's there and our ability to benefit from that possible. Bangladesh's construction workers in the Middle East, Filipino and Indonesian maids in Hong Kong, Chinese migrant workers, Indian cotton farmers, Malaysian sailors delivering goods to the rest of the world and the degraded environments that accompany that. Of these things often even cohabit the same place, being entwined with one another in incredibly intimate ways. So uh, in looking for speakers to, to talk with us about this, I, I was looking for people who are first prominent in their own right. Secondly, speakers who, even if they're not geographers, are speakers that geographers read uh, and who are, interact with, with the geographical community in, in, in multiple ways. But in particular, speakers who've been long deeply engaged with Asia and with Asian perspectives and come to us with both the empirical knowledge and the theoretical proclivity to help us think about what it might mean to speak back to our conventional ways of understanding the world from, from these perspectives of emergent Asias. And I chose to focus in particular on South, Southeast and East Asia. There's only so much you can talk about in a hundred minutes and that's the part of the world that, 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 I, that, world that I know best. Um, so we have four, I think, absolutely stunning speakers. I'll introduce them to you now, and then we'll just let them speak one after the other for up to 20 minutes. I'm going from my right, from your left to right. First speaker is Professor Ananya Roy, Professor of City and Regional Planning at the University of California, Berkeley, Distinguished Chair on, in Global Poverty and Practice, the Educational Director of the Bloom Center for Developing Economies, and the California Professor of the Year in 2009. She is known for her scholarship on urbanization in Asia, in particular in the ways in which urbanization connects across different cities and different regions from South Asia to the Middle East. Uh, has built up a rich body of empirical knowledge from which she's started to find ways to indeed speak back to theoretical conventions through terms which now circulate quite broadly within and beyond geography, such as informality, worlding, and subaltern urbanism. She's also known for terrific scholarship on poverty and, and the poverty industry, if you will. Her book, Poverty Capital, was awarded the 2011 Paul Davidoff Book Award by the Association of Collegiate Schools and Planning. Our second speaker is Professor Fulong Wu from the Planning Program at the University of College London, where he holds the Bartlett Professorship. He's also director for research and joint coordinator of this China planning research group. His research examines China's urban development and planning and its ch social and sustainability challenges within the context of China's changing political economy, not only st studying and writing about this in, in, in the literature that we're familiar with, but working closely with policymakers on the ground in China as an advisor uh, where, where his ideas also get a great deal of attention. His recent books include Urban Development in Post-Reform China and China's Urban Poverty. Our third speaker is Anna Lohenhaupt Singh, who is a professor of anthropology from the University of California, Santa Cruz, a Guggenheim Foundation fellow and holder of the Martin Chambers Award for Outstanding Research in the Division of Social Sciences. She is known for her for scholarship, which connects between nature, economy, and society and culture, combining both on the ground local ethnographic research with it with a deep global perspective. She also has a term friction which is circulated widely in and beyond geography as a way as a trope which describes how 
different kinds of, of, of ways of living and environments rub up against one another in ways which never really erase those differences even as they are put into play respect to, with respect to one another. And it's now involved in highly collaborative research, really examining the marketization of the Matsutake mushroom in, in the Matsutake World's Research Group. Our final speaker, final speaker is Jim Glassman, Professor of Geography at the University of British Columbia, who has written a book, Thailand at the Margins, which is a terrific study of the long development of, of, of Thailand's political economy. He's done research looking really down the, down the Mekong from southern China, from Yunnan province, all, all the way down to the delta of the Mekong, found in the Mekong. He's written on social movements, contesting development policies across Southeast Asia, and on re most recently on how U.S. foreign policy has been an underappreciated factor in shaping what we often think of as Asian development model. So please join me in, a, in, in, in welcoming the four speakers, and we'll ask Ananya to begin. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be a part of this panel, and I want to start by thanking Eric Shepard for having made the theme of emerging Asia's prominent at this year's AAG. My brief talk this evening is titled, When is Asia? Two months ago, India's Ministry of Housing and Urban Poverty Alleviation convened an international conference on inclusive urban planning. Meant to inform India's 12th five-year plan, the conference led to something more bold, the Delhi Declaration. Foregrounding the theme of inclusive growth, the Delhi Declaration is a recognition of the urban poor and their needs in terms of spaces of living and working as valid and crucial concerns of planning. The Delhi Declaration is part of a historical conjuncture which I term the making of the Asian world-class city. In our work on Asian urbanism, Iwa Ong and I designate the Asian world-class city as a worlding practice, an experiment to instantiate some vision of the world in formation. In particular, the Asian world-class city is a claim to the future, to the future that is imagined to be the Asian century, a century dominated by the rise of the economic powerhouses of China and India. It is thus that in tracing the lineages of the 21st century, Arigi charts the new Asian age, a shift of the epicenter of the global political economy from North America to East Asia. And the Asian world-class city is inevitably produced through what Ong and I have analyzed as the inter-referenced nature of global urbanism, where reference like Dubai, Singapore, and Shanghai shimmer on the horizon. So let me be clear, when I use the term Asia, I mean it not as a geographical location or even as a set of circulations, but rather as a set of citations, a structure within which teleologies of development are referenced and revised. It is in this sense that we need to ask not where is Asia, but rather when is Asia. It is tempting to think about the, Asia, the making of the Asian world-class city as a template, an infinitely replicable template. But I want to make a distinction between the citationary and the formulaic. It is also tempting to think about the Asian world-class city as a template of crude neoliberalism and its attendant processes of dispossession and displacement. Indeed, my own work has been attentive to the violent frontiers of urbanization in India, from slum evictions to state-led land grabs for special economic zones and urban development projects, all of this through which Indian cities are being remade as world-class, and the fierce social movements that have thus ensued. However, today, I'm suggesting that the Delhi Declaration recasts the Asian world-class city as a form of government that exceeds the logic of dispossession and displacement. Following Paul Rabinow, I'm interested in how the terrain of the urban 
becomes the matter of government and how such forms of government must be understood as the emergence of a field of rationality. In Rabinow's words, a normative project for the ordering of the social milieu. Such a normative project is not only about economic futures, what the McKinsey Global Institute famously declared a couple of years ago as India's urban awakening, but it is also about the government of poverty, about what the Delhi Declaration imagines as inclusive cities. So a few words on the government of poverty. In a recent reflection titled After Subaltern Studies, Partha Chatterjee notes that the figure of the insurgent peasant as mass political subject, which was at the very heart of the project of subaltern studies, needs to be redrawn. In particular, Chatterjee draws our attention to the deepening and widening of the apparatus of governmentality, to how the activities of government have penetrated deep into the everyday lives of rural people and to the constant tussles of different population groups with authorities over the distribution of governmental services. Chatterjee marks an important shift in post-colonial theory, from a study of subalternity as a general attribute of subordination and thereby a politics of the people, to an emphasis on governmentality. But Chatterjee's reflection stops short of two analytical moves. First, he's surprisingly silent on the matter of urban government. As has been the case with subaltern studies, it is peasant insurgency that animates a theory of politics. In such formulations, the urban masses cannot be imagined as the subject of history, and thus come to be marked by a strange double subalternity. Second, Chatterjee limits his conceptualization of politics to this idea of tussles between the people and government over services. But many other frames, including those that interpret the art of government as the locus of problematization and politics, are possible. With this in mind, I'm interested precisely in the government of urban poverty as a key element of the making of the Asian world-class city. As the surplus of meaning inherent in the new Asian age, that which cannot be contained within the frames of unbridled economic growth or neoliberalism. So it is thus that India's ambitious national urban renewal mission, evocative of a past era of Nehruvian modernization, on the one hand promotes a reform urbanism that enacts the liberalization of the economy, and on the other hand creates forms of inclusion for the urban poor for example, through a new slum-free cities initiative. Slum-free cities is not just the impulse of slum redevelopment and thus dispossession and displacement, but it is also the complex task of valorizing the slum economy, the people's economy. Framed as a new deal for India's urban poor, slum-free cities is a program of social protection and legal recognition. It is also the effort to integrate the urban poor into market rule through new technologies of calculation and visibility. Central to such efforts is the state's project of unique identification, Aadhaar, spearheaded by Nanda Nilakani, a mogul of India's software industry. Nilakani has argued that inclusive growth in India is about giving identity about giving every Indian an acknowledged existence, letting them participate in the fruits of development. And Nilakani very interestingly contrasts this moment with previous moments of state intervention. So in a recent interview he says, 30 years ago we talked about roti, kapra or makan, food, clothing and shelter. And 10 years ago we talked about bijli, sarak, pani, water, roads, power. But in the next 10 years, we're going to talk about bank accounts, mobile numbers, and biometric identification. What I'm arguing then is that to understand emerging Asias, and my opening question, when is Asia, we need to pay careful attention to the project that is development, capital D development. In a brilliant essay, Gidwani and Reddy argue that India's urban present is a post-development formation, 
one in which the urban poor is superfluous to a regime of capitalist value, and where neither the apparatuses of the state nor of the urban bourgeoisie seek social engagement with the surplus humanity. The Delhi Declaration reminds us that the government of poverty seeks to act upon the population that is surplus humanity. It means that accumulation and even dispossession can proceed not just through superfluity or abandonment, but also through paradigms of inclusive growth. Those that are intent on making sure that the poor man has his value represented on paper, which is how slum-free cities, inspired by Hernando de Soto, frames its mandate. In previous work, I have termed such enactments poverty capitalism, and while poverty capitalism is not unique to the geographical location that is Asia, it is fully implicated in the performativity of an Asian world-class city that values and valorizes inclusion. And here, once again, I want to signal the temporality of this project of development. What is significant about this emerging vocabulary of shared prosperity or inclusive growth is not a remedial character, but rather its reference to a new and rearranged world order of development and underdevelopment, a post Bretton Woods world order where, in fact, recently the BRICS meeting in Johannesburg very audaciously declared a new development bank. It also references a new rearranged order of development and underdevelopment where there's fast and furious experimentation with welfare programs and human development in that vast swath of territory we imagine as the global south. Be it the making of the world's largest development NGO in Bangladesh, or right to the city policies in Brazil, or a vigorous debate about a guaranteed minimum income in South Africa. So my colleague at Berkeley, Loic Wakant, has argued that America is the laboratory of the neoliberal future. Perhaps we can argue that the global south, understood not as a thing, but as the Komarovs have recently argued, as a set of relations, is the laboratory of the future of development. It is possible then to read these rearranged geographies as the multiplicity and heterogeneity of capitalism's futures. It is also possible to read them, as Arigi does, as the terminal crisis of American hegemony and the renaissance of East Asia. Arigi, though, I believe gets it wrong when he suggests that the neoconservative project for the American century is over, overshadowed by the new Asian age. As geographers from Matt Spock to Derek Gregory to Deb Cohen have demonstrated, American imperialism remains a vital part of our historical conjuncture. Asia, as citation, obscures many things, including perhaps such vectors and forms of militarization. Indeed, Origi's framing, I would argue, consolidates rather than disrupts the hegemonic formations that are now already underway in Asian powerhouses. For a glimpse of that hegemony, consider India's 12th five-year plan, which is framed around the theme, faster, more inclusive, and sustainable growth. I kid you not, faster is the opening move. And it is a 12th five-year plan that imagines that India's more than billion citizens now have higher expectations about their future than they ever did before. That the economy has to grow faster and faster in the next 10 years and deliver the benefits to the billion plus citizens and meet their higher expectations. So I'm intrigued by these temporal imaginations of the Asian century, of the self-referentiality of the 9% growth rate. Paul Virilio had once written about war at the speed of light. Should we today talk about cities at the speed of light, Asia at the speed of the 9% growth rate? But once again, I want to draw attention to the citationary structure of such spatio-temporalities. And the citation here is not simply to a hyper-future, but also to a past, to that trope of Renaissance that Origi rather uncritically adopts. So here's a closing story. As the Delhi Declaration was being drafted in India, I was in fact at a different conference, 
one on post-colonialism and geography at the National University of Singapore. There's a great deal I can say about these dislocations and locations, but I won't. On our last evening, we left the lavishly state-funded human capital infrastructure of NUS to have dinner in the Kampong Glam Heritage District of Singapore, a productive site at which to explore the question, when is Asia? The Kampong Glam neighborhood, now a heritage district, was designated as a Malay settlement in British colonial master plans. Anchored by the Sultan Mosque and neighboring madrasas, the area came to be seen as home not only to merchants from the Indo-Malay archipelago, but also to those from the Arab world. Street names evoked these distant and yet familiar geographies, Basra, Muscat, Baghdad, Kandahar, and the generic Arab street. As Brenda Yeo has argued, the conferral of the street name Arab Street by the British indicates the effort to identify the area as an Arab kampung, a recognizable racial unit. The designation of Kampung Glam as a heritage district took place in the 1980s when historic conservation became important in Singapore. These efforts were part of, as Yeo and Huang discuss, a broader straight state project to reclaim, I quote, Asian roots as a bulwark against westernization. Thus, at that time, Minister of State George Yeo was to declare, as we trace our ancestries, we form a clearer vision of what our future can be. At the heart of Kampong Glam, like Musket Street, it is lined with a series of arches, each depicting the global interconnections that bind Singapore to the Arab world. At the entrance, it's a brass plaque. It signifies the reopening of the street in 2012 as a joint redevelopment effort of the city-state of Singapore and the Sultanate of Oman. The murals prominently feature trade maps, specifically shipping routes from Muscat to Canton and Singapore. We are instructed to view them as reflecting Kampong Glam's role as a hub for Arab traders during Singapore's early history and to think about the maritime and trade connections between Singapore and Oman, which have continued to this day. As in British colonial urban planning, this script creates stable ontological categories of recognition, of Arabness, and as in the case of the state-led urban redevelopment of the 1980s, the joint Singapore-Oman venture is a tracing of ancestry in order to forge new destinies of global capitalism. I present the murals of Muscat Street to you as an instance of the worlding of Asia. Following Heidegger, this can be understood as a world view, not a view of the world, but the world understood as a view. As a world view, the maps of Muscat Street also decenter the world. Sans date, they narrate a glorious and timeless history of economic hegemony, one in which Muscat, Canton, and Singapore are the centers of a world order world cities bound together in a geography of familiar relationalities. Heidegger reminds us that in the age of the world view, we are in the picture, in everything that belongs to it and constitutes it as a system, it stands before us. What stands before us in Muscat Street is Asia as a system, Asia as a reopened world order, Asia as Renaissance. To ask when is Asia, is to interrupt Asia as a world view. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for inviting me. Uh, as I told you, I would be in China. Uh, indeed, I uh, came here yesterday from Shanghai. So I was tempted to use a title to say uh, from uh, Shanghai to LA. Uh, hoping to bring some uh, uh, research insights uh, from China. Um, because traditionally, we very often use uh, theories derived in the West uh, to apply it then uh, in uh, China. Uh, we uh, describe Chinese cities under the character, character of uh, the third world city. Uh, the, not long ago, we used the socialist and the post-socialist to describe Chinese cities. Uh, more recently, we used the global south to 
describe China. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I didn't use the title because I think it's misleading, uh, although it's a metaphor. Uh, because I'm not, I was not in Shanghai. I was actually outside uh, Shanghai in the deep rural area in southern China, uh, in the uh, city of Shantou, uh, one of the four special economic zones set up by Deng Xiaoping, uh, perhaps uh, the least developed economic zone. Um, I was advising uh, the, the local government to, prepare, to revise their master plan. Um, so I think Shanghai cannot represent Chinese cities, just uh, LA cannot represent American cities. Uh, so, probably let me uh, clarify a bit uh, the meaning of the emerging cities in China. Uh, of course, it means uh, the new cities have been developed, uh, new development because China is experiencing fast urbanization. It also means a new feature has been created uh, because these new features could not be described adequately by existing theories derived from a different geographical context. It might also mean uh, new stages. Uh, these stages are not necessarily following a predefined trajectory, uh, as uh, Eric, you mentioned in the introductory. Um, in a, for a complex system, it may mean uh, phase transitions. It also means, may mean uh, new possibilities, i.e. we may uh, change the course of development through our collective uh, actions. So now look at China uh, thinking uh, the emerging urban process under the world factory. What happened, especially uh, after China joined the WTO? First of all, I think through economic devolution and decentralization of economic decision-making power to, uh, and fiscal arrangement with the local government, China has created entrepreneurial local agents. And the entrepreneurial local agents uh, try to sell the land, to use cheap land to attract investment. And when investment come, and it attract labor. And the problem of this kind of a mode of development is that labor is excluded from the urban uh, regime. And also, uh, spatially, uh, the land is fragmented and presented as spatial fragmentation. So therefore, it is not a city, but really a if you like, a planetary urbanization, if I try to hook on the new concept we discussed intensively recently. But very interestingly, economic devolution and market reform did not lead to the declining role of the state. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, the central government has uh, seen a declining uh, uh, revenue, but shortly afterwards, you see the rising government revenue. More precisely, uh, the, right, the, the concentration of wealth is in the hands of the central government. For the local government, uh, it, they have to take uh, significant social uh, 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 responsibilities. And you can see that their uh, expenditure, indicated by the red line, has exceeded the, the, uh, its uh, revenue, which create a significant funding gap, uh, fiscal gap and the local government has to fill up this gap by entrepreneurial behavior. And therefore, the land revenue has become a very important source of development, uh, local revenue. And you can see, like, like city of Hangzhou, its local land revenue actually exceeds uh, uh, local revenue. Uh, for many Chinese cities, uh, it could easily reach uh, half 50%. So the business model of Chinese cities is that uh, to lease, to acquire cheaper rural land to attract investment in industrial development and then promote economic local uh, growth uh, and promote uh, property development through uh, uh, place branding and then uh, sell the land uh, to generate a revenue and then recycle the revenue the, the profit to fund mega urban projects to generate more development opportunities. Therefore, local government has to compete with each other, as you can see from this map. Uh, this is a, a strategic plan for Guangzhou, prepared by uh, planners in, uh, from Beijing. It is very much like a battlefield map. Uh, and therefore, the city planning has to 
take an important function to brand place, to promote a place, to fulfill state-led uh, development and to produce globalized spaces. So land acquisition and land investment. And you're all familiar with uh, uh, the, the central uh, CCTV uh, building uh, nicknamed as uh, uh, Big Pants. But now you see other uh, type of buildings, uh, which uh, the left on the left is uh, uh, the trousers uh, built in uh, uh, Shuzhou. And on the right hand side, it nicknamed as uh, Bra or Bikini uh, in the uh, city of Hangzhou uh, as an uh, entertainment and a cultural complex. However, you are seeing Chinese cities are becoming globalized or uh, modernized. That's uh, just uh, one side of the story. Uh, the process of globalization or uh, urban development uh, at a world scale has to run across the local territory. Uh, therefore, you will see that it has to build upon the uh, complex local uh, terrain. And you see, uh, for those who study uh, socialist and post-socialist geography, you are probably familiar with the left-hand side figure, i.e. in the socialist period, the social structure was not homogeneous. At the core was state-owned uh, enterprise employees who enjoyed the benefit from the occupational welfare. But also, at the periphery, you also see urban population working in uh, collective enterprises who may not have a workplace uh, affiliation. At the periphery, you see the rural population who has never been uh, institutionalized into the state system. So therefore, you see inside and outside of the state system. When rural migrants come to the city, they could not assess the public housing. They have to land it in the rural villages, now becoming urban villages, uh, in the private rental. Basically, it's the informal housing market. So now let's move into the rural area to see what the impact of this globalization process. In the southern uh, part of the Shantou, uh, it, it is a densely populated area, uh, could be described by uh, the Skirta area, uh, a, a term coined by uh, Terry McGee to describe uh, in uh, Indonesia. Uh, it's a basically a mix of city and village. And in that place, it is a, a a place uh, of a traditional rural area, peaceful and tranquil, and there's a strong tradition of clan and worshiping the ancestor. And in one of this uh, town in the area, uh, it's Guiyu uh, town, and it became infamously becoming the global uh, dumping yard uh, of electronic waste. Uh, local farmers dismantle uh, electronic waste uh, to extract mantas. And you can see that the water has been severely, severely polluted. You also see emerging housing types, uh, such as this three-in-one, combining workshops, warehouses, and residences. And, uh, but the infrastructure has been severely underdeveloped. A more scaled version is a factory dormitory where migrants lived in, and therefore they are segregated from the urban life. Uh, even a more scaled version is industrial uh, districts or so-called uh, uh, economic and technology development zones in Beijing. But people may call it uh, this uh, industrial zone as uh, post-suburban Beijing. But really, the Chinese new towns are not a, a process, uh, purely a process of suburbanization or pro uh, the industrial uh, office decentralization. It is more outcome of uh, entrepreneurial local uh, government who want to develop uh, the land. Therefore, in, chi in China, you see increasing complexity and heterogeneous. You see uh, carefully planned, master planned communities like, such as this uh, new town in Shanghai, Thames Town, designed by global actor firm Arkings, mimic uh, English market town style. But also you see uh, informality, informal markets developed uh, in the periphery of the city uh, in Shenzhen, uh, so-called urban villages. But to understand this phenomenon of urban villages, you have to understand the era before the global development. 
And so I found that all these concepts are very useful, edge cities, skate communities, and slums. But when you look the, uh, closely uh, from the Chinese perspective, you see it has a very much local reasons, local uh, structures. And the concepts such as informality and marginalization and illiberalism are relevant, but ha you have to modify them. For example, if you talk about marginalization, it is not uh, just an economic restructuring and a restraint of the state. It is rather a dominance of the state and categorization of population, therefore, deprive some groups of their citizenship. If you talk about neoliberalization, it is not as an ideology, it, but it is more kind of a pragmatism to legitimize a state. And therefore, you see a very strange combination of the uh, state. I often uh, use the term that Chinese city is a laboratory, therefore you can observe contemporary urban changes. But I don't want to mean it is a fossil or a dead species is where you can study under the microscope. Uh, Chinese cities are changing, and in that sense, emergence are new possibilities. Uh, villages are demolished by uh, the government, and therefore, through sort of collective action, you can challenge these activities. So to conclude, I think Chinese city, cities do not represent the model of the emerging urbanism. Rather, they contain some contestulated elements of planetary urbanization. And now we see a new world-scale development processes, but it is interfacing with local structures, sometimes reinforcing and reinventing older structures and creating new properties. And both can be seen as emergence. And uh, these new features are not predefined and are not predictable and in a, a complex uh, system theory. And therefore, uh, we can change it through our collective actions. And emergence in a complex city sense uh, it is not just uh, of the global conquering the local. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the local institutions are becoming indispensable part of the new phase of development. If you think about informality, rather being eliminated, it is emerging and reinforced, and it is part of the world factory model. And there's a hybrid nature of the market mechanism and state-led fast urbanization which opens up new possibility for comparison. And indeed, uh, it's useful to uh, compare in that sense. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. The title of my talk today is, What is Emerging? Supply Chains in the Remaking of Asia. And I don't have a PowerPoint, and I hope you'll find that exotic and interesting. <laughs> I also hope you might be amused and not horrified by my attempt to take the prompt I was given completely literally, and instead of representing Southeast Asia as I think I was supposed to, to instead rashly try to address all of the prompt's elements in less than 20 minutes. Here was the prompt, presumably written by Eric. Emerging Asia. This title references three aspects of Asia today its rapid reemergence as a center of the global economy, its enormous diversity as a region, and within the heterogeneous subregions of Asia, the expanding differences in the livelihood possibilities of those who have come to live prosperously and those, wait, um, and those who live precariously. This session, he says, is conceived as a provocation to US geographers to be paying more attention to Asia and to its distinctive perspectives and voices. Research examining Asian biophysical and nature society processes also is encouraged. So I decided to take it all on. <laughs> it's a big set of challenges. But perhaps we can make some small headway by considering how the concept of emergence itself has changed in the new century. Remember the 1980s and 90s? In those days, what was emerging in Asia was tigers and dragons, the so-called new economies, imagined as dynamic sources of creativity and wealth creation. 
tigers and dragons. Sometimes those who were unhappy about tigers and dragons told us about gorillas, as in the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Occasionally, too, there were flying geese. But what were all those animals, and where have they gone? Animal metaphors were affirmations that countries were units of analysis, internally coherent and self-motivated actors on the global stage. As long as the news was all about growth and unfolding power, it was possible for analysts to delude themselves into such imagined self-making, every country with its own independent metabolism. In times of insecurity, polarization, and loss, it's easier to remember interdependence. The early 21st century has been a good time to start again with the question of what's emerging in or as Asia. What's emerging, among other things, is a set of capitalist supply chains that ricochets across national boundaries and within nations from rural and even tribal to urban and from squatter settlement to prison to suburban paradise, and which, with all its attendant quirks and legacies, has remade the global po political economy. To get back to animals, it would have to be one of those termites that outsource the, their digestion to fungi or the ants that bring up the larvae of butterflies. There is no self-contained organisms here. Better yet, each country might look more like an ecological assemblage rather than an organism at all. Histories of disturbance create ecological patches, or in my metaphor, class niches and chains of interdependency. But there's no metabolic unity in an assemblage, no single rhythm, pulse, or heartbeat. Deep theoretical issues reveal themselves here, and not just for political economy, but for every kind of social process that might crisscross and constitute Asia and the spatial units we imagine within it. We need what I think of as process ontologies of space and place, that is, ways of seeing geographies coming into being. We need to see these geographies constituted not in self-making, but in the dynamics of encounter, which I call friction, not conflict, but the rubbing together that produces something new. Despite my use of a distinctive vocabulary, I think such approaches have become quite common in recent scholarship. Still, it's worth reviewing how they allow us to re-examine histories of emergence and the problem of emergence itself. Let me tell a story, necessarily abbreviated, that shows us one form of emerging Asia. It's a story about a contingently distinctive kind of supply chain mobilization that created a heterogeneous Asia of precarity, cheek and jowl with privilege in the second half of the 20th century. While I start in Japan, this is not a story about Japan. If anything, it's my story about Southeast Asian refugees in the United States and the Asia of salvage and displacement they inherit and negotiate. It's my story about kinds of human disturbed ecological spaces that don't occur much anymore in Japan, but only in other places, such as China, Korea, and the US Pacific Northwest, where Laotian and Cambodian Americans come to pick wild mushrooms in no longer successfully industrial forests. But it'll take me a few minutes to get there and a journey through much of what we know as Asia. That that this requires area study skills that no one scholar can master should be self-evident. And if those of you who know aspects of this history better than I do come up later to correct me, I will be very grateful. What emerging Asia came out of Japan with its supply chains? Since the Meiji period, the exploitation of national, regional, and cultural difference as an element of international trade has been key to the formation of Japanese business institutions. The Meiji government sent young men overseas to learn new ways of doing business and to translate those foreign skills into useful additions to the Japanese economy. The new traders would be masters in crossing linguistic and cultural differences. These translation skills would serve an archipelago newly imagined as without enough resources for a modern economy. Foreign trade was organized as a form of translation. After World War II, this legacy reshaped itself in a form that influenced the rest of the century. Japanese businessmen began with the following dilemma. U.S. power supported Japanese economic growth after the war, but not unlimited imports to the United States, the world's best market. The solution of Japanese business was a putting out system to Korea 
Japanese capital supported export-oriented Korean businesses bypassing American quotas and enriching both Japanese and Korean elites. In such arrangements, trading institutions became key to the accumulation of capital through linking di divergent cultural economies. This too was the era of Kretsu enterprise groups. At their heart, trading houses linked with allied banks who advanced money to the traders to set up supply chains abroad. In contrast to American business models, Japanese traders did not aim to create Japanese-style business abroad. As one commentator puts it, Japanese business after World War II aimed to be odorless, without the taint of Japan's wartime legacy. Japanese traders forged links across difference, not clones. Translation, not reproduction of the same, was affirmed as the model for trade. Japan's supply chains spread across the world, but were particularly concentrated in Southeast Asia, where Japanese trading companies were able to form chains through supporting Southeast Asian Chinese entrepreneurs. These ethnic Chinese entrepreneurs, in turn, were encouraged to expand their businesses under Cold War repressive regimes in Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, and the Philippines, each of which wanted wealth to be concentrated in the hands of politically disenfranchised elites, such as the Chinese. After traffic in both Jakarta and Bangkok was closed down in 1974 by demonstrations against Japanese economic imperialism, Japanese businessmen redoubled their efforts to remain invisible in Southeast Asia by funneling capital through Southeast Asian Chinese businessmen. Southeast Asian Chinese business leaders financed by Japanese capital thus became cronies to dictators, even as they directed Southeast Asian resources to Japan. Japan's influence moved under the radar. Riots in Southeast Asian cities could target the ethnic Chinese. This emerging Asia grew. Soon enough, Southeast Asian and Korean conglomerates began to form their own transnational supply chains, following Japanese models, but seeking out ever cheaper and ever less regulated supply sites. After the US-sponsored Plaza Accord of 1985, which changed currency values to disadvantaged goods from Japan as well as Southeast Asia, further outsourcing spread like wildfire, moving supply sites across China and mainland Southeast Asia. By this time, indeed, the US and European ec economies were stressed by the success of what had become Asian models, accumulation through supply chains. Playing on the thread of Japan, a small radical group of stockholders and business school professors in the United States were able to change the US economy completely. They, over they overthrew the corporation as a social institution in favor of the global supply chain model, which promised more profits for stockholders. Without the looming example of Asian supply chains, they might have been ignored. Directing the public gaze toward Asia, they prevailed. In their success, they qu quickly forgot the transnational conditions of their rising. In a peculiarly American way, they erased their memories, claiming the innovation as their own. Soon enough, they began teaching supply chain management, US style, around the world, including in Japan. Still, in this friction, an emerging Asia transformed the US and the world, for better or for worse. Consider, for example, Nike, once a US distributor of shoes for a Japanese trading house. Japanese traders taught Nike how to do global supply chains. Later, Nike was considered an American innovator because it was one of the first high-profile American firms to be built on outsourcing. But Nike learned this model from its original Japanese sponsor. Still, Nike eventually also transformed the model, making it newly American. Nike added celebrity branding and the stylist swoosh to production in foreign factories. This is the new America of value-adding style to goods produced in sweatshops. Emerging Americas, as well as emerging Asias, happen within such tangles. Follow any chain, and it will take you across all kinds of unexpected places, prosperous and precarious, familiar and exotic, emerging Asias popping up all over. I followed one chain to the forests of the US Pacific Northwest and Southwest China. And while I haven't been to Northeast China or North and South Korean forests, I know it to be important there 
as well as in less remembered emerging Asias, such as in Bhutan. This is the supply chain of matsutake mushrooms, an expensive delicacy in Japan, but since the 1970s, due to environmental changes in Japan, quite rare in forests there. No one has succeeded in cultivating a matsutake mushroom. All the mushrooms are hunted wild in forests. The mushrooms are pricey enough that wherever they're foraged and sold, they make an important contribution to pickers' livelihoods. This chain sponsors globalization and supply chain management Japanese style. No Japanese or Japanese firms need touch the mushrooms in their supply sites. The entire business depends on a chain of ever more divergent business relations. Japanese importers work with supply country exporters who work with regional bulkers, who work with local buyers, who work with independent pickers. This is a chain of translation across difference, one form of productive friction. It uses, supports, and remakes the heterogeneity of the social landscape, not just rich and poor, but also rifts in the political culture of labor, property, and natural resources that is the shape of what's commonly called the economy. Geographies in process come to matter as they both organize and are organized by these proliferating social differences. In Matsutake forests around the world, emerging Asias show themselves among the trees. In the former industrial timber of the U.S. Pacific Northwest, for example, two emerging, emerging Asias intertwine. One is the translational structure of Japanese supply chains. Japanese traders do not expect American mushrooms to be foraged in a Japanese way. American mushrooms, they explain, are picked and sold in self-consciously American performances. Japanese traders relish the difference. They're expert translators. Japanese importers relate with gusto their trips to this exotic Wild West with its strange American psychology of competition and violence. They do not need to convert their suppliers to Japanese ways of life. It's difference that gets out the mushrooms. In American forests, they explain, mushrooms are trophies of Wild West freedom. During shipment to Japan, the traders translate them into transactional, transnational commodities. Translation as trade makes the commercial matsutake harvest possible. Meanwhile, a second emerging Asia motivates the mushroom hunters. Each is an independent agent without an employer, wages, or benefits. Each forages for his or her own reasons. Chief among these reasons, mushroom hunters say, is freedom. But what is, the, what is it they mean by freedom? Most matsutake pickers in the U.S. Pacific Northwest are refugees from Laos and Cambodia, and the forms of freedom they described are embedded in Southeast Asian histories of war and displacement. Differing communal agendas have blossomed here. Hmong refugees proudly relive jungle fighting in the U.S.-Indochina War. Khmer pickers in the same woods aim to cure themselves from Civil War's horrors. Ethnic Lao refugees stage the risky entrepreneurship they imagine as wartime commerce. Mian mushroom hunters build village communities in the forest to momentarily forget the wounds of war. Each of these agendas is often self-described as freedom. Each is also tied to continuing cross-Pacific commitments and everyday reminders of old wars. Southeast Asian wars and their political aftermaths come to life again and again in the forests of the U.S. Northwest through the Matsutake commodity chain. It is war experiences that motivate the pickers to the dangerous work of forest foraging. This is another emerging Asia, the long transnational aftermath of imperial and civil wars. Old wars mobilize mushroom hunters. This is not what we generally imagine as capitalist discipline. Yet it is not free of capitalism. Only the power of Japanese supply chains allows this efflorescence of Southeast Asian politics in U.S. forests. I might call this a peri-capitalist formation. It exists near and around the possibilities of capitalist accumulation without being organized by industrial forms. In this too, the two emerging Asias I've described are intertwined and interdependent. Southeast Asian war-motivated picking produces mushrooms that can be sold through a commodity chain based on Japanese translations. Together then, capitalist supply chains and their para-capitalist suppliers begin to produce the mosaic of heterogeneity with which we know Asia today, with its cultural and regional diversity and with its precarity and privilege. These are produced and tied as difference 
by a translational system of capitalist supply chains itself made in Asia. The heterogeneity of the social landscape tapped by capitalist supply chains is non-human as well as human. Natural resources as well as labor may be a peri-capitalist adjunct to the supply chain. For non-humans as with humans, value is salvaged from damaged social landscapes rather than created from a disciplined industrial scene. Thus, the emerging Asia of Oregon's Matsutake forest is salvaged from the ruins of an earlier industrial forestry. You might be asking, how is it that Southeast Asian mushroom hunters are allowed to run wild across American forests? The answer has to do with the fact that in, the area, the timber, in this area, the timber companies have already left with their takings, leaving the forest as a kind of industrial ruins, neither wild nor under capitalist discipline. Without timber revenues, there's no one left to do much policing of the forest. Instead, salvage collectors come for the mushrooms. Supply chains have proven expert mechanisms for salvage, salvaging value for capitalism. The weedy heterogeneity of non-human as well as human landscapes is mined. Matsutake is one such weedy resource, a form of diversity produced accidentally by in industrial ruin and utilized by supply chain capitalists. If I had more time, I would take you to the ruined forests of southwest China, where the Matsutake commodity chain also supports and encourages heterogeneity, the making of livelihood niches in damaged forests, the use of cultural diversity to make class, the wealth piled up by bosses through the getting by of ordinary people. But let me return to emergence to reiterate a few points. First, emerging necessarily takes apart our units of analysis, requiring attention to places in process. Thus, for example, the U.S.-Indochina war continues to reach across the Pacific to mobilize political identities and factions. Second, the kind of emerging found in global supply chains dissolves national solidarities to develop pockets and niches of difference that can be translated along the supply chain into capital accumulation. The war stories that motivate Southeast Asians to pick Matsutake in Oregon exemplify the pockets of difference that can be translated for capital. Difference becomes a resource, gaps widen, cultural differences and class differences converge in the making of global supply chains. Heterogeneity thrives. One important emerging Asia is in these mosaics of capital tapped difference. Finally, the biophysical world, which my prompt said should not be forgotten. Matsutake forests produce biological difference as well as human social difference that can be salvaged for supply chains. As a concept, salvage reminds us of earlier management projects such as industrial logging and their ruination. Salvage is what we have left to live by. The supply chains I've been describing make use of difference, human and non-human, in the ruins of progress. It's both heartening to know this difference as still life-giving and terrifying to know it as a world of ruination. Emerging worlds around us have that double quality and one provocation of emerging Asia's is to allow ourselves to consider those implications. Thank you. It's both very nice and daunting to go last after three excellent presentations and have the challenge of putting an exclamation point on them. Uh, but it's nice also to go right after Anna, who uh, challenged herself to summarize quite a bit in 20 minutes. And I'll give myself some of the same challenge. What I want to talk about in this brief talk is two kinds of processes that are often seen as emerging of or from Asia in the post-World War II period, processes that became significant objects of study by scholars both from Asia and elsewhere from the 1980s and 90s onward, those two phenomena being broadly the emergence of a so-called East Asian developmental state and second of all, the emergence of Asian values discourse. And what I want to do in particular is suggest that in many ways, neither of those kinds of phenomena should really be seen as emergences of or in a narrow sense from Asia, but rather that they represent transnational processes that happen for particular reasons to have loci of emergence within particular spaces in Asia. Now, in prosecuting that argument, I want to try to draw, in the first instance, from a framework 
uh, that's been elaborated by the well-known historian of Korea, Bruce Cummings, a political economist of Northeast Asia. And interestingly, he frames the concept I want to start with not in his writings on Korea, but in a recent book he wrote that surprised many of us called Dominion from Sea to Sea, which is a history of the United States, a history of the United States facing west, facing toward the Pacific, and in fact crossing the Pacific as it expands. He calls his perspective here Pacificist, and I want to borrow that perspective. It draws out especially the idea that the U.S. military industrial complex has played a central role both in the expansion of the U.S. westward and the shaping of California, for example, and in the expansion of the U.S. across the Pacific. I want to borrow from that concept, and I want to give it even a little more specificity uh, with thanks here to James Sidaway for encouraging me to use this particular term, but I want to talk about the formation of a Pacific ruling class, of ways in which, for example, that military-industrial complex extended across the Pacific and formed alliances with different leaders in Asia to help, in fact, foment the development of developmental states and, in fact, Asian values discourse. So where developmental states are concerned, this is a construct that in many ways was framed to try to help explain the tremendous economic dynamism of East and Southeast Asia from as early as the 1950s onward. And certainly a signature moment in the development of the literature on the developmental state was the publication by Chalmers Johnson of his path-breaking study of Japan's Ministry of International Trade and Industry, Miti and the Japanese Miracle. And that book, among many others, including many that followed by Alice Amsden on Korea, Young and Wu on Korea, and many others, uh, set a high standard for studies of what came to be called the developmental state, viewing that state broadly through what I'd call institutionalist or neo-Weberian lenses. Uh, now, if the matter is simply how well did the developmental state theorists do in challenging liberal or neoliberal nostrums about the nature of growth, uh, I've long said that I think the neo-Weberians get the better of that argument. They show quite aptly and ably that industrial policy and different forms of state guidance of the market play a crucial role in the, in the development, say, of Japan, in Johnson's case, in the case of South Korea, which I'll get to shortly in the work of Alice Amston and others. But I've also long been a detractor of this neo-Weberian developmental state hypothesis in various ways. Uh, particularly for its methodological nationalism. And that's a problem that has actually been attacked by a number of scholars from a number of directions. Some of my compatriots in South Korea, like Baekhyun Park and Dongwon Kim, for example, are uh, unearthing a lot of the ways in which that notion of a national developmental state in South Korea really misses a lot of the local and subnational specificity of the development of industries, the development of state policies, and so on. My own approach to this has been to challenge that construct from a transnational perspective and look at how different forces like those connected with the U.S. military industrial complex help shape that allegedly national developmental state. Now I'll turn in a little bit to South Korea where I've been doing some research recently, but I really want to start uh, to elaborate a more transnational notion of the uh, developmental state where Chalmers Johnson's study starts with Japan. And for that, let me resort to some ideas from the quite remarkable study of the U.S. occupation of Japan by John Dower, his book Embracing Defeat. Dower does quite a number of fascinating things in this work, but I wanted to point to two which have directly to do with the developmental state argument. One thing that Dower does is to point out something well known by political economists of Japan, namely that Japan's industrial recovery after the Second World War, which was by no means guaranteed, really hinged crucially on the outbreak of the Korean War and subsequently several decades of war orders and offshore procurement contracts from the U.S. military. And to give an example of some of this impact, Dower points out how key industries such as the steel industry and the automotive industry benefited tremendously from the war orders that came pouring in, leading to the real emergence of, of post-war Japan's industrial prowess. That was well understood by Japanese leaders, by Japanese corporate officials. The head of Toyota, for example, called these orders Toyota's salvation and, uh, and averred that he felt a mingling of joy for his company and a sense of guilt that he was rejoicing over another country's war. 
Now, Dower's account doesn't just emphasize that the alliance between the U.S. military and Japanese industry helped spur Japanese growth. He actually argues that the Japanese developmental state itself, not just companies like Toyota, really were shaped by this Pacific ruling class alliance. And in particular, the U.S. occupation forces, the Su Supreme Command Allied Powers housed in this building in Tokyo, really took over a lot of the administrative policies and policies for guiding the market that the Japanese government had implemented during the Second World War and extended them into the post-war period, in great part because they wanted to ensure the rapid recovery of the Japanese economy. Not only U.S. leaders, but Japanese leaders uh, and businessmen all felt that this was the best way to refurbish the Japanese economy to make it strong enough to withstand communist challenges and the like. Uh, the, Su the Supreme Command Allied Powers, by the way, commonly known as SCAP, this provided the basis for an amusing neologism that Dower points out emerged in the 1950s. Many Japanese began talking about Japan as pioneering not a Japanese model, but a Scapanese model. And indeed, uh, the key nodal agency that Chalmers Johnson studies in his work, MITI, was not the creation of the Japanese state, but the creation of the U.S. occupation. So we get not only the emergence of Japanese industry, but the formation of the Japanese developmental state as a result of this alliance between these transnational forces. Now, the Korean story in many ways parallels what happened in Japan, only delayed by a decade or so. In 1961, when Park Chung-hee came to power in a military coup, a four-year period ensued uh, that was really the run-up to the development of the South Korean developmental state. And during that period, there was fairly intense negotiation with U.S. leaders that had to do with the kinds of roles that South Korea would play in the U.S.-Vietnam War effort. They also had to do with the fact that one of the major objectives for the U.S. in this period was to reduce its aid burden with South Korea. Many U.S. leaders had come to see South Korea as what they called a mendicant state. And the objectives included then to get Korea to sign a normalization treaty with Japan so that Japanese capital could begin flowing into the, Japanese, uh, the South Korean economy and buttress its growth. Uh, and in addition, the U.S. hoped to get South Korean troops committed to the war effort in Vietnam. And indeed, Park Chung-hee ultimately by 1965 delivered on both those promises, signing a normalization treaty with Japan and sending uh, eventually as many as 300,000 South Korean combat forces to fight in Vietnam alongside U.S. troops. Now in exchange for these commitments to what the U.S. wanted, South Korea got something very valuable, something that was announced in an early 1966 memo to the uh, South Korean foreign minister but kept secret for most of the rest of the world for four years until the Symington Committee uh, outed the agreement. Basically, South Korean firms were given the opportunity to bid on U.S. offshore procurement contracts from the military without any competition from Japan and in fact without any competition from any other firms except U.S. firms, which basically allowed the U.S. military to uh, divert funds into South Korean industrial growth. And a large number of Korean firms began to benefit from this to a tremendous extent. Hyundai, for example, uh, really boomed as a result of war contracts, including, for example, getting the contracts to dredge Kamran Bay Naval Base, to build barracks, roads, airstrips, and other such things. Hyundai wasn't the only company. It wasn't the only construction company. Many smaller companies like De Lim, Lucky, Gold Star, and so forth benefited from this. So did the transportation company Hanjin. And the benefits weren't limited to the Vietnam War period. Rather, like Japanese industrial firms who garnered these contracts over several decades, Korean firms garnered them beyond Vietnam. For example, when they went to the Middle East with U.S. military forces that were building bases there in the 70s and early 1980s. And so overall, in fact, if we look at the Korean construction sector, U.S. offshore procurement contracts came to, the, to a value equivalent to roughly 21% of the total output of the Korean construction sector during the Vietnam era, a little bit less than that, uh, during the era where most of the contracting was going on in the Middle East. And these are only the procurement contracts from the U.S. military. Korean firms reaped quite a number, in fact, more private sector contracts 
in the Middle East, for example, simply by having followed the U.S. military there. This was a major boon to what was in fact one of the key industries to South Korea's industrial takeoff, and it formed the foundations too for what uh, many Korean and Japanese scholars have called the formation of a construction state. As in the Japanese case, it's not simply a matter of the U.S. military industrial complex spurring the growth of Korean industries, but also buttressing the growth of the developmental state. When Park signed the normalization treaty with Japan, part of the agreement, which had been encouraged by the U.S., was large, a large Japanese reparation payment. And with the acquiescence of the U.S., Park immediately plowed those funds into his dream project, a national steel industry, the Pohang Iron and Steel Company, which in a sense served as a kind of nodal industry, helping underpin the growth of all other industries in South Korea in this period and allowing some degree of state planning for that process. In addition, the United States rewarded Park for signing the Normalization Treaty by providing the funds to form the Korean Institute of Science and Technology, not today the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, a state agency to develop engineering prowess to draw Korean engineers back from universities in the United States, and again, to help underpin the state's capacity to pursue industrial growth. So here what I'm arguing is that both the Japanese and South Korean developmental states, key instances of this phenomenon of emergence, are much less phenomenon of Asia than they are the interactions between Asian leaders and folks like Walt Rostow, who was busy promoting his theories of stages of economic growth, or uh, the US military leadership under people like Lyndon B. Johnson in the Vietnam War period. The Asian values discourse, which I want to talk about, is another phenomenon that uh, really began to emerge as a topic of conversation in the 1980s and 90s, but especially after uh, former Singaporean Premier Lee Kuan Yew announced the notion of Asian values, using this as a way to try to fend off what he framed as ethnocentric criticisms from Western organizations and human rights organizations for lack of full, fully democratic practices or observation of human rights in countries, especially in Southeast Asia. And what he claimed is that this was ethnocentric because it failed to recognize the greater emphasis that Asian societies, and particularly Confucian societies, place on communal welfare, collective well-being, rather than individual rights and freedoms. Now, that Asian values debate that was stimulated by this flared briefly among academics in the 1990s and then began to fade a bit, but the general argument has recurred again and again, often from Asian leaders, and as one example particularly germane to work that I do, after the 2006 military coup in Thailand, which ousted the elected Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, a former and unelected Prime Minister, Anand Panyarachun, scolded Australian journalists and scholars and academics uh, for being a bit critical of the coup, and he chose not to scold them simply by saying you don't understand democracy. He literally accused them of not having an adequately Asian mindset, not understanding that for Asians, something such as ousting by military coup, an elected prime minister might not in fact be an affront to good political practice, especially if, as in this case, the military was claiming to protect venerated institutions like the Thai monarchy. Now, the rather overt opportunism with which some of these kinds of Asian values have been invoked by people like Anand has led some people to be dismissive of them and simply say they represent obvious attempts to legitimize authoritarian governance on the part of Asian leaders. But as some Southeast Asian scholars like Gary, uh, Gary uh, Roden and Kevin Hewison pointed out many years ago, there's a quite remarkable convergence between many of the Asian values arguments put forward by people like Anand and some fairly conservative ideological statements from people in the West or in the United States. So, for example, uh, in a, an early policy study crucial to US, uh, U.S. Cold War planning, a document called NSC 48, U.S. planners in an early, an early draft noted that by tradition and preference, Asiatic peoples turn to authoritarian government. Now, in a sense, if you sort of reverse the uh, emotional vectors of this, you get the Asian values argument. Notably, uh, sensitive souls sort of took this out of the final draft of NSC 48, but that kind of sentiment was very common among U.S. planners wading into Asia. And here it's useful to go back 
uh, to the U.S. occupation of Japan, which Dower discusses, because at the point that the U.S. entered into Japan, there was a significant issue about what would happen to Emperor Hirohito and the entire Japanese imperial system. As Dower notes, there was much discussion on the streets in Japan about the possibility of the emperor abdicating or being tried for war crimes or even the entire imperial system being abolished. But that didn't turn out to be the preference either of Japanese leaders or of the US occupation authorities. And in fact, the prevailing view among those authorities, the latter authorities, was expressed well by the head of the US translation unit, Sidney Mashbeer, who said that it would be the height of folly to kill the emperor who is merely the product of 2,500 years of biological ungodliness. And this kind of Orientalism, which you can read through in the rest of the quote, really combined quite nicely with a clear sort of opportunism on the part of the US occupation authority, since as Mashbeer said in response to a question, the US really needed to depend upon the blind obedience of Japanese to their emperor, specifically to try to encourage a form of authority that would be part of the Cold War reconstruction process in Japan. Now, that kind of thinking was quite, uh, quite readily accepted by people like the supreme commander of the Allied forces, Douglas MacArthur, who is much taken by certain orient orientalist notions about uh, the authoritarian character of the Asian mind, and who also quite liked to see himself as rather the first emperor of Japan after the Second World War to be assisted in his projects by Emperor Hirohito, uh, as you see here. Now that project actually required that Hirohito himself be reshaped in certain ways. He was encouraged to don civilian clothing, to make the rounds to every district in the country. He had been a barely recognizable figure, a very remote figure for most Japanese before the war. But now he was in a sense to become the people's emperor, a sort of representative of Japanese uh, admiration for this venerated historic institution. Well, much the same project was actually entertained and encouraged about a decade later in Thailand, one other place in East Asia and Southeast Asia where that kind of royalist system is quite germane to the development of authoritarian government. And here I'll point to the statement of a U.S. ambassador to Thailand in the early 1960s, U. Alexis Johnson, who with the same combination of Orientalism and opportunism, noted to his colleagues that a coup they had backed in the late 1950s in Thailand was one about which they not need feel self-conscious because the uh, support for an authoritarian government in Thailand based almost entirely on military strength, aside from the practical matter of Thailand's not being truly ready for a democratic form of government, the United States derives political support from the Thai government to an extent and degree which would be hard to match elsewhere. Well, one of the things this led to is a, a very significant project by uh, Sarit Tanarat, who had taken power in the late 1950s in a coup backed strongly by the United States to make the young king Bumipon, who you see on the left, a known figure in Thailand. He wasn't a known figure in the 1950s. He was barely recognized by many Thai. He'd been on the throne only fairly recently, taking over at age 17. And it was literally a project of various US actors to carry the king's picture to the countryside, along with posters and whatnot, to make him into a venerated uh, uh, authority figure among the Thai public in general. This particular USIS officer has noted recently, in fact, the kind of work that the US government was itself doing to provide what he calls public relations uh, for the royalists in Thailand. And this helped buttress a strongly authoritarian and pro-royalist state which still today features some of the most draconian laissez majesty laws that have ever been implemented and that are still implemented today to punish political opposition. Now I'd like to just conclude by saying that these two forms of emergence that I've discussed, there's a bit of a politically non-innocent paradox in the fact that they've been focused on to a great extent by various scholars as forces emerging of or from Asia. First of all, because that sort of analysis tends to both validate those emergences and obscure the role of organizations like the US military in helping their emergence along, but it's also done something else, which is to sort of obscure from view some other kinds of social phenomenon that I think might more genuinely be seen as in some sense deeply or indigenously Asian. So for example, the South Korean labor movement, a very powerful force by the 1980s and 90s, 
emerged largely on the strength of its own resources, without any of the kinds of assistance from the U.S. Embassy or the U.S. military that the Korean developmental state got. And as scholars like Hagen Koo and Jamie Doucette have shown, it also emerged in part on the basis of deeply Korean idioms, notions of Minjung, the people that helped consolidate a sense of unity among various workers in quite dramatic struggles. It helped to deeply democratize South Korean society. In a similar fashion, uh, the contemporary Thai red shirt movement is something fairly poorly understood in much of the West because of this blockage provided by the notion that all Thais venerate and love the monarchy. The red shirt movement has emerged largely on the strength of its own resources. It has a very nuanced and uh, a, a nuanced kind of way of approaching the relationships between democracy and monarchy. And what I'd like to say finally then is that maybe these kinds of social movements emerging from within Asia deserve at least as much attention as developmental states or Asian values and perhaps too as much of the kind of international solidarity that made the former very prominent phenomenon. Thank you. Have those talks got you thinking? They've certainly got me thinking. Please join me in, in, in thanking the four speakers. We don't have time for a question period, but I know you can come up afterwards and tackle them. And as Doug said before, we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and find it as stimulating as I found this evening. Thank you.